All right, so um, good afternoon and, and, and welcome everybody to, to this webinar organized by the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, FIA in short. Uh, my name is Mikael Vigel and I work as, as FIA's um, research director. Um, at FIA, we've been in recent years um, very much investing in research on, on Nordic cooperation. Um, and this we've often been doing in, in cooperation with, with our Nordic sister um, institutes. Um, at present, for example, we run a project funded by the, by the Nordic Council of Ministers on Nordic security of supply and, and crisis preparedness. But the project that we're, we're today going to present and discuss is the pro project entitled uh, Nordic Cooperation and the Consequences of, of Travel Restrictions during COVID-19 um, that FIA um, was running during the Finnish presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers in, in 2021. And this webinar really is the, the launch event of the main research outcome of that project, which is which is the report titled um, Nordic Cooperation Amid Pandemic Travel Restrictions. A few short words on this project. Um, its aim was really to explore the consequences of, of travel restrictions um, that have been adopted during the COVID-19 crisis on, on Nordic cooperation, both at the local and, and, and the political level. And the project was conduct conducted by researchers um, from the Danish, Finnish, Norwegian and Swedish Institutes of, of International Affairs, as well as by the researcher from Nord Regio. Um, and it was coordinated by, by FIA. Um, and as such, I think it's a, it's a good showcase example of, of Nordic cooperation in itself. Um, um, the researchers were uh, Nina Nyberg Sörensen and, and Telli Betul Karakan from Denmark. Uh, Katja Kreutz and Axel Lares from Finland, uh, Christine uh, Haugevik from Norway, Sofie Berlin from Sweden, and Alberto uh, Giacometti and, and Marie Vöjen Meyer from Nord Regio. And, and they all did a, a fantastic job um, putting this report together um, without actually without being able to meet in, in person at all. Um, so Nordic cooperation amid uh, pandemic travel restrictions indeed. So today we'll, we will hear uh, presentations from some of these uh, participating researchers on the following topics. First, um, some general remarks on uh, Nordic cooperation and its, its drivers and constraints. Um, then some more specific remarks on what the effects have been of the pandemic travel restrictions on, on cross-border communities um, in the Nordic uh, in Norden, um, and also what consequences these measures had had on, on political cooperation. Um, and finally, we'll be presented with some general uh, comments on the report uh, provided by a member of the project's uh, reference group. However, um, we will start this seminar, or sorry, this webinar uh, by giving the floor to, to Minister for Nordic Cooperation and Equality, Thomas Blomqvist, um, and we are indeed very grateful um, for having the minister participating in this webinar and paying attention to uh, the issue of Nordic cooperation in, in pandemic times, despite the fact that, that this launch event is, is arranged um, in a time when the Finnish presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers has already ended. Um, minister Blomqvist is, is the Finnish Minister for Nordic Cooperation and Equality since 2019, uh, Member of Parliament for the Swedish People's Party since 2007, and he has served as chair uh, of the Swedish parliamentary group in, par in, the, in the parliament of Finland. Um, he, he has also been involved in municipal politics as, as member of, of a local council since, since 1993. Um, but before giving the floor to Minister Blomqvist, I'd like to remind everybody um, that questions and comments can be posted in the chat function, um, and we will address them at the end of this uh, seminar. So now, uh, Minister Blomqvist, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, the participa participants, dear friends, uh, as I'm sure you all know, Finland chaired the Nordic Council of Ministers last year, and the research report that we are about to discuss today is the end product of a priority project for the Finnish presidency that we choose to launch in order to learn from the events uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we were preparing for our presidency, the pandemic had already hit us, and we could see that the pandemic also presented some particular challenges 
to our Nordic cooperation. Today, looking back at that decision, I'm pleased that we took up, up this task. I believe that one of the strengths of the Nordic societies is the willingness and the, and the ability to learn, adjust and adapt. Dear friends, uh, I'm very pleased to participate with some introductory remarks in this event that discusses the travel restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic and their consequences for the Nordic cooperation. It is not for me to dive deep into the findings of the report ahead of the presentations that will shortly follow. Still, I would like to highlight some findings that I find particularly important as we aim to strengthen our joint Nordic coordination and responses regarding possible future crisis. Reading uh, the report makes it uh, very clear that we have been through tough times. Uh, with uh, respect to travel restrictions, people living in the Nordic border regions were hit particularly hard. Their everyday lives were much affected by the restrictions. Uh, as a consequence, the report finds that trust in Nordic cooperation and Nordic freedom of movement in particular seems to have eroded. The report recommends long-term trust-building measures, and I think this is very much to the point. Dear friends, uh, on a more positive note, the silver lining of the pandemic might be that it seems to have pushed officials at various levels in the Nordics both to establish new informal contacts and to increase the use of already existing networks. In short, dialogue was improved across many fields and formations, and this is also my own personal experience among the ministers for Nordic cooperation. We must maintain this enhanced level of dialogue also when the pandemic someday has receded. I also note a shared ambition among the Nordics to learn from the past two years. With this in mind, mapping and analyzing the past events and actions can give us valuable insights as we prepare for the future. What worked well, what could be improved, and how we might go about it. The report on the table today is a valuable contribution to this discussion, and I would like to thank and congratulate all the partners involved in writing the report for a job well done. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the next presentations and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Minister Blomqvist and for those opening remarks um, and also for perhaps pointing out um, the sil a silver lining in this in this crisis I think I think that's a valuable message as well and especially I, I very much concur with the with the need for for the trust building trust building measures here um, now um, uh, Christine Haugevik uh, will give her uh, general remarks on Nordic cooperation Christine Haugevik uh, is Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and she holds a PhD in Political Science from the University of Oslo. So go ahead, Christine. Thank you, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to say a few words about the drivers and the constraints of Nordic cooperation. That's quite a big task because it's a comprehensive uh, cooperation. But I look very much forward to the presentation and discussion of our report on how the Nordic states responded to the first phase of the pandemic. Now, back in the days, uh, one could say that Nordic studies used to be somewhat anemic, if I'm allowed to say so in this forum. So when I first entered the academic world in the mid 2000s, 
most of the scholars who talked about the Nordic region, they did so in the context of Europeanization, internationalization and globalization. So the Nordic region and intra-Nordic cooperation as such was not something that leading international relations scholars seemed particularly interested in or concerned with. In fact, in the 1990s, Ole Weber, uh, now a professor at the University of Copenhagen, predicted that the Nordic region would become less relevant as a category and political entity. So in 1992, he diagnosed that there will be still be lots of Nordic networks, lots of Nordic cooperation built on the closeness of the languages and so on, but politically and emotionally speaking, the driving idea will not be Nordism. So instead, Weber predicted a Baltic, possibly also Arctic, re-articulation of the Nordic. However, in recent years, I would say that there has in fact been a revival of interest in the Nordic region and in Nordic cooperation. And I would say that this is true both in terms of academic circles and in political circles. So why is the interest rising? Well, let me just highlight a few factors. Uh, so the first has to do, I think, with changing circumstances and the removal of some traditional barriers to cooperation. So when the Nordic Council was founded in 1952 and the Nordic Council of Ministers two decades later, foreign security and defense policy, most notably, was off the table. And while foreign and security policy is still not officially part of the Nordic Council of Ministers' remit, with the end of the Cold War, with Sweden and Finland's EU memberships and the issue of NATO becoming less politically sensitive in the Nordic region, I would say that a new space has opened up for discussing a lot of matters and potentials more openly. So I think that's one factor. There is less sensitivity, there's more room for maneuver to develop Nordic cooperation. And I think we've seen also with the first Stoltenberg report uh, back in 2009 and then the Bjarnason report in 2020, that there is a willingness to explore the potential for further Nordic cooperation and to trigger debate also about, for example, institutionalization and formal uh, structures. A second reason why the interest in the Nordic is now rising, I think, is that many international institutions are now under pressure from processes of deglobalization, deinstitutionalization, disintegration, and nationalization. And I think in the Nordic countries, unlike, for example, EU membership, at least here in Norway, uh, so compared to that, Nordic cooperation is politically uncontroversial. So to my knowledge, there is no no to Norden movement in any of the Nordic states. Uh, the cooperation is branded as pragmatic. There are very few super nationalist ambitions and those who want a united Nordic federation remain few in numbers. And polls in the recent years show that citizens in all the five Nordic countries are even more supportive of Nordic cooperation than they used to be in the past. A third reason why Nordic cooperation is back in the limelight is that the Nordic states individually and as a group have been cast as a success story. So the Nordic economies are doing well. They continue to top rankings of all sorts. There is more press freedom, more gender equality, more developed welfare states than in many other countries, and so on. So the potential for further Nordic cooperation seems almost endless if we put these criteria, criteria uh, as a point of departure, given that the Nordic states are so similar and so like-minded, at least in relative terms. So seen from Washington, seen from Beijing, seen from Moscow or even London, the Nordics see and approach the world in similar ways. In the UN Security Council, they even seek a seat on a rotating basis, seeing the elected state to uh, represent the region as a whole. Intra-Nordic intra cooperation has also worked well. Historically, the Nordics were pioneers in the freedom of movement and open borders. The creation of the Nordic Passport Union in 1954 allowed Nordic citizens to travel and reside in the Nordic countries without passports. And it has been described as one of the most visible results of post-war Nordic cooperation. And it's also, as polling shows, uh, one of the most appreciated aspects of Nordic cooperation among the region's citizens. And it has been a reference point and a mod model for other countries to build upon. A fourth factor why I believe Nordic cooperation is trending has to do with the increased interest in crisis management in all the countries. 
So the financial crisis in 2009 uh, became a push for the Nordic Defence Corporation in the sense that the Nordic states saw more advantages of pooling their administrative and economic resources together. And then came the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, which was even more powerful in pushing Nordic uh, Defence Corporation forward. And in all the countries in recent years, there has been growing awareness around concepts of societal security and resilience, total defense and so on. And the value of Nordic cooperation comes in in many of these domains. And as the pandemic has shown, uh, the next crisis may not come at the time or in the form that we expected. So taking this into great consideration and against that background, what is the problem then? Why is there not even more cooperation if there are so many advantages? And why did we not see a more coordinated response to the COVID-19 pandemic? When the crisis hit, one could argue that the Nordic states still come across as an uncoordinated quintet, even though they stress the valuable aspects of Nordic cooperation. And the management of the pandemic, especially in the first phase, showed that there is improvement potential. And I think one important explanation uh, that we are probably going to talk about more later in this seminar is the fact that the Nordic states has been, have been hesitant to commit to formal structures and units and institutions for problem solving. So the Stoltenberg uh, report uh, suggested some, um, some institutional establishment. A review that the Nordic Foreign Policy Institute conducted 10 years later showed that in the instances where formal institutions have been, had been recommended, uh, it was less likely that the suggestions had come true. Uh, and Björn Bjarnason said the same in his presentation in 2020 when he, he put forward his report. He uh, indicated that formal units, structures, is the most difficult uh, measure to, to proceed with. So instead, the, the states tend to opt for softer means of cooperation, such as information change or cooperation through soft law instrument. And so the informal is sort of what um, what is, is prioritized the highest, and of course also something that's seen as a particularly valuable asset in the Nordic cooperation, uh, referring back to the trust that has already been mentioned a couple of times in this seminar. Um, flexibility is another key word. Uh, very often one size does not fit all in Nordic cooperation. There are, for example, simple topographical differences, which makes uh, all Nordic cooperation less relevant in some instances, whereas tri- and bilateral forms may be more relevant in, in certain contexts. Uh, there's also a matter of, of other institutional cooperation networks, uh, where the Nordics very often are seen to belong to one another's inner concentric circles, but perhaps not necessarily one's first priority. Uh, often the Nordic comes sort of in a second or even third uh, order behind the national and other institutional corporations, such as NATO and the EU. So as, as my former colleague Nina Grego once put it, Nordic cooperation is nice to have, but it's not necessarily need to have uh, in the security and defense context that was. And a final observation is that the Nordic states, when they are talked about as a success story and as a model for other states to be inspired by, uh, there's a tendency that we perhaps underestimate the individual differences. The fact that the Nordic states do have different identities and action repertoires, their societies are set up differently, not least uh, when it comes to responding to international crises, when it comes to setting up security, defense and societal security structures. So they follow each other closely. They are very often each other's main reference point, but they do operate in different contexts. They have very distinct histories, experiences, political debates and individual preferences. And such differences can create friction in the management of crisis. Uh, the Nordics are neighbors, they know each other well, they are good at learning from each other's debate and, and following uh, one another's advice. But at the same time, um, there is perhaps a tendency to think of them as more similar than they actually are. And I think uh, some of the findings in our report is going to highlight that. So I think I will leave it at those few uh, general remarks first, and I look forward to hearing the discussion uh, of our report later on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christine, and, and uh, for that, that very insightful summary. 
the drivers of Nordic cooperation and perhaps also some of the, the hindrances. Um, your point about a certain lack of institutional establishment very much resonates resonates uh, with me. I think uh, without common institutions, uh, Nordic cooperation is very much at the mercy of political conjunctures. Um, but um, we'll now continue with um, Alberto Giacometti, who besides uh, being a great sculptor, is also a research fellow at Nordregio, specializing in, in regional development and, and governance. Albert, uh, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you Dave, for the kind uh, introduction. And I guess my hobby is uh, more regarded than my research task, but I'll try to do my best here as well. I'll share a few slides if that is possible. I hope you can see them now. So as um, mentioned I will focus mostly in uh, the chapter 4.1 of the report which is uh, on the local societal impact uh, in border areas. Uh, my colleague and I, uh, my colleague Marie von Meyer and I uh, focused uh, in uh, so to say um, the empirical side of uh, talking to people on the ground uh, rather than focusing too much on numbers and statistics. And also because there is a big problem uh, with numbers and statistics uh, in terms of, of what can we rely on them. Uh, and also it's difficult to distinguish causality from uh, specifically border restrictions from other types of measures such as lockdown, quarantines and so on. Uh, we uh, did our work mostly around the three uh, areas you can see in the map, the Torne Dalen, uh, the Svinesund and Oresund regions. Uh, and uh, just as a quick preamble, of course, uh, we understand that the pandemic took a toll on the society at large, so not just border communities. Uh, but uh, border communities have experienced the pandemic in particularly shocking ways. And a number of nuances have come through this study that we will uh, be presenting today. And uh, we also would uh, claim that the crisis has exposed the fragility of border communities to global crises and to top-down decision-making uh, from national level. Uh, also, it's good to say that uh, there are many voices within media and in politics that, that narrow down the, the, the importance of border communities to uh, just border shopping or uh, just uh, the number of commuters. And then this is uh, very dangerous assumptions uh, that can lead to problematic decisions uh, made uh, when border communities are much more complex than that. It's about, it's about people, it's about families, it's about a, a common identity, a history, and of course also the, the, the many economic uh, aspects that link them together. But while free mobility and uh, free markets have been uh, actively pursued, um, the institutions that are meant to protect the citizens' uh, rights and integrities uh, have not necessarily followed suit. And um, we could say that the impacts we have observed uh, from the lack of common approaches and evidence of this. Uh, just quickly to run you through the Torne Dalen, uh, this region gets its name from the Torne River that uh, physically uh, divides the, the two countries uh, of Finland and Sweden. Uh, but the Torne River shouldn't be seen necessarily as a barrier, a border, yes, but perhaps not a barrier. And uh, quoting a local interview, uh, they said that uh, in the past the river was the road, not the border. Indeed, it was one country and uh, the, 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 the river serves as a means of communication and a joint identity developed around the area. Many uh, people still identify themselves as Tornedalian. There's this old, uh, old language, Menkeli, that perhaps struggles to survive. Um, and people are used to live uh, across borders unhindered, even today. Most iconically, perhaps, uh, with the twin city, Haparanda Tornio, that are to well amalgamated uh, cities, but uh, this is true also throughout the whole uh, border area. Up to 50% of the population in Haparanda is, has a foreign background and 34% are born in Finland specifically. This tells much about uh, the nature of uh, uh, integration. Of course, labor markets and supply chains and the economy are very well integrated, and this is also evidence in institutional structures uh, like cross-border committees, 
uh, bilateral agreements and uh, cross-border public services. Um, and it's per, per, perhaps because of this level of integration that the, the hard borders or sudden re-emergence of hard borders have been so shocking. Um, heavily armed border guards have been uh, deployed to look after the border. Uh, a fence uh, was erected in the middle of Victoria Square, separating Hapur and Atornio. Uh, this has been compared to the Berlin Wall for, by some there have been barricades in many of the bridges uh, along the river. And uh, maybe some uh, older uh, members of the society remember the Second World War. They mentioned that um, that not even back then uh, there was such level of security in the border. All of these have resulted, of course, in uh, divided families, many people who cannot see their uh, many of their family members. More strikingly, uh, separated uh, couples that have a shared custody of children had to exchange the, the kid uh, directly at the border. Um, distressed students that go to uh, the, the binational school who were either not able to go or uh, had to confront the guards in the, on the way. And many commuters who describe as very stressful the situation of uh, having to prove constantly the reasons for uh, crossing the border. Um, much uh, is said as well about the tension that has arisen within the society uh, and uh, people who maybe defend one or other approach of, uh, for the, the, the pandemic uh, and uh, not being welcome uh, in certain circles because of having been in, in the other side, so to say. Um, also being mentioned the lack of or the limited accessibility to certain services um, some public services like bus station or a pool, but uh, in many of these communities, there, um, especially more remote ones, there is no accessibility to all, all kinds of shops and supermarkets uh, in one side of the border. So many people are used to travel many kilometers to find these services, but in some occasions people have had to travel well hundreds of kilometers to uh, within their country because they could not travel uh, just a few kilometers across the border. Eventually, some concessions were given also, uh, allowing for a more flexibility to border communities specifically. Uh, but this was also heavily criticized as providing an artificial division uh, of, uh, of creating borders within the country. Um, I will move faster and not giving so much uh, context about Svinesund and other Sund regions, but there is also in these regions a high level of integration. People are used to cross, uh, live this borderless life. It's natural for uh, them to look for jobs in both sides of the border. And uh, in both sides, Oresund and Svinesund, we see also a very uh, close level of cooperation subnationally uh, by the local authorities. In Oresund, obviously, uh, it's much more densely populated. We see a high number of commuters. Uh, but commuters might be just as uh, one of the indicators. There is a very complex relations between business ecosystems uh, that are closely intertwined. And Copenhagen provides also many good job opportunities for Swedish people. Uh, not to mention that the Castro Airport is, uh, is 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 of um, big, big importance for uh, for uh, all the south of Sweden as well. Just to give some uh, quick uh, commonalities that we've identified in, 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 in all the cases is um, uh, in terms of labor market and society, for example, um, much has been said about the imbalanced treatment workers have been given. Uh, for example, uh, some had to be tested every seven days where their colleagues from the other country didn't, even though they were both meeting each other uh, and so on, many of these examples. Uh, Norwegian and Finnish commuters who had had to continuously be in quarantine because of working in Sweden, not being able to pick up their children in schools or things like, or seeing families or friends. There's been uh, many issues connecting to the, the rules of social security and for law, uh, being double taxed uh, or, or not being able to be paid at all because uh, in the case of uh, Norway, for example, the, some workers were not uh, 
necessarily uh, enabled or impeded to work, but they were not able to cross the border, so they couldn't be paid either way nor been compensated for that. Uh, much has been said about uncertainties for commuters, the continuous changing ro uh, rules, difficult to keep up with that. And, um, and uh, also very interesting, uh, the competence development is an, um, for many of the people who have lost their jobs, particularly in, in tourism and hospitality sector, uh, have uh, made the decision to increase their skills, so they have enrolled in education. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a, a problem for the sectors that already see that many of these people are not going to come back to their previous jobs. Um, um, oh, another important issue has been mentioned about traditional social institutions, uh, such as marriage, and so that has been uh, come up as, as as some of the valid reasons for traveling uh, or for crossing the border. So these. Uh, the, this social institution uh, that many considered uh, an archaic, so to say, or many many couples who don't marry anymore uh, could not see each other. The same is true about uh, funerals, for example, many people who have not been able to attend. And uh, this is critical for uh, thinking about the future resilience. Some people have actually reconsidered the possibility of living a life across borders. When it comes to economy, it's important to mention that uh, the impact vary significantly depending on the economic structures and, uh, and, and the sectors. Uh, looking from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, the degree of this, the uh, diversification of the economy have uh, played an important role in how the economy has um, uh, reacted in terms of unemployment and, and, and turnover. But uh, the devil's in the details, of course. If you if you dive a bit more into sectors, there's many nuances. Um, when it comes to industry, mining, process industry, manufacturing, many have described business as usual, in fact. Uh, and this has much to do to the w very well functioning supply chains. Uh, they have reacted extremely well, uh, despite uh, a, a number of bottlenecks, but uh, most supply chains have reacted extremely well. And some of the key uh, issues some of these companies have had are not related to supply chains, but more to labor. So they haven't been able to, for what I mentioned, uh, Swedish workers not been able to cross to Norway, for example. Uh, in, in contrast, uh, tourism, retail are some of those sectors that have been heavily impacted uh, because they don't re rely only on trucks crossing the border, but they rely on people crossing the border and shopping and for recreation. So those are obviously some of the heavily impacted sectors. There's an important aspect of directionality here as well. Uh, it's uh, heavily unbalanced and uh, often case uh, more uh, Swedes cross to Norway and to, and to Denmark, but more Finns cross to Finland, uh, Finland come to Sweden uh, than the other ways around. And when it comes to uh, border shopping is also a big imbalance in directionality. Um, then uh, I have to end soon, but just to mention that there's many other less obvious impacts of this. Uh, many have uh, brought up the issue that business relations and networks are built over time. Distrust is built over time and there is many, so to say, lost opportunities for not being able to meet many undone deals simply for the uh, not being able to meet. Uh, finally, digitalization has also some impact here. Uh, E-commerce has exploded with good and bad effects, some for bad for some businesses, but also has generated uh, higher employment in logistics. Um, when it comes to trust, there is many uh, ways to see uh, around trust. Uh, and uh, here uh, an important element is to mention that that border communities are not just organic constructions, but they have also been politically willed. And uh, many people see as a betrayal to their uh, this promise of their opportunity to live across uh, borders uh, once the, they have been closed. And uh, many uh, other aspects of mistrust are very complicated. So I don't have time to untangle this right now. But but for example, uh, public institutions. Uh, people rely on public institutions, but often don't rely on decision makers' ability to make choices for them. Um, and then, of course, there's the interpersonal trust, us and them uh, um, kind of trust. 
And I skip some things and I will just finalize by saying that in, in all of this, cross-border collaboration has played a, a very important role. The top-down measures, of course, have undermined the role of soft governance structures, the role of cross-border uh, committees, for example. Uh, but nevertheless, local authorities uh, and these committees have found a very important, have still played an important role and have found new ways to maintain the dialogue. So nevertheless, they have played an important role. Uh, but I stop there now and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto, um, for sharing your findings uh, on, the, on, on these consequences of the pandemic. Uh, measures on cross-border pandemic travel restrictions on, on cross-border regions from a from a variety of, of, of perspectives. Um, let me just remind everybody of, of indeed the possibility of uh, posting questions and comments in the chat function as we go along and we'll I'll, I'll keep a track of them um, and, and take them up towards the end of the seminar. But now we continue with Katja Kreutz, Acting Program Director for the Global Security Research Program at, at FIA, where she also leads the, the Nordic, uh, FIA's Nordic Network. And her main field of expertise is international law, and she holds a Doctor of Laws degree from the, degree from the University of, of Helsinki. So, Katja, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Mika. And uh, now is my, my first challenge is to share, of course, the slides. So, so let's see uh, whether I succeed with that. It might take a while. Here we go. So I hope you can all now see the, the slides. So dear audience, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here today and present the findings of the report. Uh, before such an esteemed list of participants. And uh, we have spoken about the report in the abstract, but let me show it in, in a printed form. It looks like this, like a fear report, uh, and uh, it's fresh out of the oven. So you can find it both online, and if you want a printed copy, you can also be in touch with FIA and, and we can send you one. Not even the researcher, researchers uh, have seen the, the printed form or yet, so I, I'm, I was glad to show it to you uh, as a start. But as was stated by the chair of this webinar, uh, the Finnish Institute of International Affairs managed this project and I had the pleasure of, of doing that. Therefore, I, I also want to thank, uh, sincerely thank my whole research team so a warm and a big thanks to, to Nina and Telli in Denmark and AXA in Finland, Christine in Norway, Sophie in Sweden and Alberta and Mare at Nordregio. And I also want to extend my gratitude to the reference group who engaged very constructively with the research and the report itself. But before turning to the findings of this report, I, as a researcher, want to say something on the research methods and limit limitations. As already noted, we were not able to meet physically and working through teams is really dreadful. Uh, and even more so, conducting online interviews is really a challenge. We did altogether 39 interviews in the four Nordic countries under study here and in Nordic institutions. I therefore urge all listeners here today to remember that both the selection and availability of the interviewees, uh, who were mainly politicians and civil servants, have naturally affected somewhat the outcome of this report. So what we present here today is not an absolute truth of Nordic cooperation and pandemic measures. It's more a snapshot in time of existing views on the cooperation. So that's good to keep in mind. We must also remember that there is a temporal limitation of the report. So what we explore is the five first quarters of the pandemic. That is from the start of 2020 to end of March 2021. And unfortunately, we also had a geographical limitation. So Iceland is not included in the report. 
because it doesn't share a cross-border region with the other Nordic states. So the starting point for the analysis is that Nordic cooperation to a large extent was negatively affected by the adoption of national travel restrictions, that is closing the borders. There was no joint Nordic approach to the pandemic. The trust between the Nordic countries has been put to test and cross-border regions have felt the effects of closed borders most acutely, precisely as Christine and Alberto already outlined in their presentations. So in comparison, for example, to the Baltic states who managed to create a travel bubble, that is a special travel restricted area, Nordic cooperation to the pandemic was largely missing. The key question then is, why was the joint approach to the crisis missing? and how the pandemic experience has affected Nordic cooperation at the political level. Are there future lessons to be learned? To start with, our report finds that the Nordics have been a key reference point for each other in handling the pandemic, and some exceptions and some flexibility regarding the other Nordic countries have been sought. So, for example, Norway issued travel advice regarding the other Nordic countries based on regions, not whole countries. And Sweden also exempted people living in Bornholm from border closure when they were negatively affected. Yet there seems to be a general agreement that finding an all Nordic approach to the pandemic was unrealistic. Finnish and Norwegian interviewees stressed the importance of sovereign solutions to the pandemic as it touched upon national security issues. Whereas Swedish and Danish informants pointed out that the pandemic evolved very fast. Moreover, there are variations between the Nordic countries regarding their governance of crisis, as was also already alluded by Christine. So this leads to the conclusion that indeed there are historical, administrative and constitutional differences between the Nordics, despite the fact that we always tend to highlight the similarities. So in Denmark, for example, politicians are more directly in control than in Sweden and could quickly close schools. This is why we have seen Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen uh, speak about Danish restrictions, whereas in Sweden, Anders Stegnell have been the front figure of pandemic measures. Finland has a historical ex experience different from the other countries, Nordic countries, with wars being fought, which means that we had the security of supply stock different from the other Nordics. Sweden relied on individual responsibility, and this is a very different uh, line of approach from the other Nordic countries. Uh, they have a different tradition than we do. But the picture of Nordic cooperation is not all that gloomy. A collective experience is that political dialogue between the Nordic increased, especially informal dialogue, as was already pointed out by Minister Blomqvist. So new contacts were created and old ones were reinvigorated. And this was made possible by digitalization, having digital meetings. And indeed, many of the interviews hope that the increased level of contacts can be maintained also in the post-pandemic uh, time, whenever that comes. And it has been also pointed out that cooper Nordic cooperation in other issues uh, has increased as a spillover effect from, from this. So, for example, the N5, the cooperation between the foreign ministers, has intensified as well. But the increased political dialogue did not lead to greater results in terms of cooperation, however. Um, it was stressed by most interviewees in, in the different countries that one success story was the repatriation of Nordic citizens from the world at the start of the pandemic. Uh, but this is not a form of institutional cooperation as such. Um, but yet it was a success to, to bring home uh, other Nordic citizens in, in your own flights. On the other hand, it proved difficult to solve 
social security issues of commuters, those who work across borders. So there has also been issues that we haven't been able to solve or the Nordic cooperation. The long term objective of becoming the most integrated and sustainable region in the world by 2030 still remains in place and enjoys political support. This was our finding. However, many interviewees stressed that it's now more difficult than before to attain this goal. In fact, there was an influential group of parliamentarians from the Nordic countries uh, who described the objective of being the world's most integrated region in 2030 as utopia rather than vision. There has been already a lot said about Nordic uh, trust, but I will also say a few words about that. Trust has been described as the Nordic gold, as the glue, the abstract glue that binds the Nordic countries together. And most interviewed politicians and civil servants from the different countries highlighted that this trust at the political level uh, remains unharmed. Uh, the pandemic and the concomitant travel restrictions are rather seen as an exception to the otherwise well-functioning cooperation. But it's worth stressing that not everybody shared this position. So the representatives we interviewed from Nordic institutions say that trust has suffered also between uh, in the political relations. And some interviews also from Denmark pointed to this. So there's not a unanimous view exactly on whether trust on political level was hurt or not. Some pointed out that the mistrust between the Nordic countries can emerge only later in time. What's however evident from our study is, and also from Alberto's presentation, is the fact that the cross-border regions have suffered uh, their trust in the Nordic de-bordering project in open borders uh, has suffered. And it's widely believed and, uh, by the interviewees that the Nordic institutions and the Nordic countries must work to repair this trust deficit and that it will take time. And we speak about years. This could be done, for example, by continuously investing in infrastructure projects that enhance cross-border living, by creating a flagship project or by having a joint statement by the ministers on the continued relevance of open borders in the Nordics. However, in this, in this uh, section, it's important to note also that the, the Freedom of Movement Council, Grenzhinderrådet, and the local advice bureaus, they were praised for their proactivity by many interviewees. So the trust in, uh, or mistrust in Nordic institutions is not, you know, doesn't cover all the actors. Then coming to the final slide on, on how to do crisis cooperation better in the future. This was one issue that we addressed in the report. Um, and all the interviewees agreed that things can and should be made better on the Nordic level when it comes to dealing with a crisis such as the pandemic. But when it comes to what measures or how decision making should look like in times of crisis, there were different approaches on how to proceed. On the one hand, there were those, often governmental representatives, expressing the view that no joint decision making should be created for crisis situations. Their point is that dialogue and information sharing can be improved, but there is no need to develop new structures. And this uh, resonates well with what Christine was saying about formalization and institutionalization. On the other hand, there were those who were positive towards the idea of creating new procedures and structures for situations like the pandemic uh, and situations when you need to take to uh, travel restrictions. There were concrete suggestions of creating a handbook with a step-by-step -step procedure to be followed in comparable situations or the creation of a forum that would be able to speak on behalf of the Nordic dimension. 
the need to have joint data available was also raised. Another concrete suggestion was to increase the flexibility of the working methods of the Nordic Council of Ministers by making uh, broader usage of ad hoc ministerial councils. This idea is, of course, not new. At the end of the spectrum of formalization of crisis cooperation, there were even suggestions for concluding a new Nordic treaty on crisis cooperation. And this would arguably fit well with the 70th anniversary of the Nordic Council and the fact that there haven't been really many Nordic conventions concluded lately. But this, this was really at the extreme side of, of how to improve cooperation. To conclude, we hope that this report sheds light on Nordic cooperation and the joint crisis preparedness of the Nordic countries so that it together with the many other initiatives and studies that have been done can contribute to the Nordics being better prepared for the next regional or global crisis that will hit them. The key to responding regionally within the Nordics to the next crisis that will come along is the resolve to have political will to act jointly. And here I, I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thanks, Katya, for, for clearly laying out the the main findings and, and, and also recommendations from this excellent, excellent report. Um, now, lastly, we have uh, Johan Strang giving his comments on the report and its its findings. Johan Strang is associate professor at the Center for Nordic Studies, University of Helsinki, and an Academy of Finland Research Fellow with the project Norden since the end of history, and he has published extensively on Nordic regional history and cooperation. So, Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would uh, like to congratulate Katja and all the other authors for an insightful, uh, well-written, coherent, empirically solid, constructive and, and very important report. I, I, uh, I learned a lot from 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 reading it, and and uh, it was uh, it was really really constructive. I've been part of the reference group during the process, and as such, it would be strange of me to come with any fundamental criticism of the final report. <laughs> but I think, as a university professor, I enjoy the liberty of being a bit more outspoken, perhaps. So I will devote my ten minutes to a bit of praise, highlighting some of the most most uh, important findings uh, of the report, but also to do a bit of provocation, trying to articulate some of the points of the report a bit more strongly. So I have five things that I, I want to say. <clears throat> and the first uh, is, uh, I, I think that one of the most important points made in the report is that the Nordic Conventions on Free Movement are in need of an update. So to the extent that the Nordic governments tried to make exceptions for, to the restrictions, their thinking was stuck in hopelessly dated understandings of, of people's social and, and working relations. Uh, and I think it's been known for quite a while now that the Nordic conventions were made at a time when people moved from one country to another and then stayed there for basically the rest of their lives. And today, of course, people have much more flexible and complicated working relations. They jump between uh, several employers, they work from distance, they work in several countries at the same time, etc., etc. But the conventions uh, were also made at a time when it was expected that people live in conventional married relationships. Uh, uh, the, the exceptions that were made to travel restrictions failed to take to, into account unmarried couples and other people with non-conventional family or social arrangements. So the pandemic has really kind of ha hammered down the point that we need a thorough reconsideration of, of the conventions and, and, and all the, the rules that regulate these issues. And I'm, I'm very glad that the report identified these problems. So, so well done with that. Secondly, a point about uh, uh, border regions. So during this pandemic, there has been a lot of talk about border regions, and I understand completely why the authors have chosen to focus on them, them in, in this report. However, I would perhaps have liked a bolder discussion of the importance of these border regions for Nordic cooperation as a whole. I don't like the tendency to think about the border regions as special cases. 
to me, uh, this way of thinking is part of the problem rather than the solution because it leads to arbitrary discrimination and it fails to recognize how thoroughly internationalized our societies have become. So, for example, people on Orland, as we saw in the chat already, have been rightly annoyed uh, of, of being overlooked as uh, legislators try to, 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 to uh, find out a way of, of recognizing commuters that, 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 that uh, cross border by, by, by land. And that's fair enough, but how about all the people that commute by air or by other means uh, from, from regions that are not uh, so-called border regions? So to me, this is the real forgotten group during this pandemic when it comes to travel, travel restrictions. I think there are more Danes that are commuting to Norway than there are Danes commuting over the Öresund bridge. And how many people in Helsinki are commuting to Sweden or Norway on a weekly basis? So, so I understand that border regions are important. Their importance does not lie in the fact that they're special cases, but in the fact that they're highlighting problems that a lot of people uh, across the Nordic countries are facing. So the way forward is not to bracket them as special cases, but to understand their experiences and use them to forge solutions for the Nordic region as a whole. And thirdly, I think the report does a great job of putting the border politics of the pandemic in a larger perspective, pointing to the fact that border restrictions since the 2015 refugee crisis have become an accepted part of the politicians uh, or the government's toolbox. The border restrictions were not a, a unique reaction to the pandemic, but part of a rising trend. So we're, we're, we're losing our trust in open borders and time will tell whether people will return to arranging their lives across national borders, applying for jobs or buying summer houses or, or, or studying or, or whatever. Uh, so do we really want to continue with this border politics and if not, how can we revise the trend? Perhaps one could also think about this in relation to a losing trust in international cooperation in general. So I'm a bit concerned with the laxness by which our governments were able to sidestep conventions like the Nordic Passport Union or the Schengen Treaty. And should we see this as part of a, a larger tendency of down, downplaying the international legal, or legal order? And if so, is it really in the interest of small countries like the Nordic ones to, to contribute to this? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a question. I think that we should see this in a, in a, in a larger framework. And fourthly, I want to say something about my favorite topic, which is, of course, Sweden. So the report makes it uh, emphatically clear that open borders presupposes that we trust each other, that we trust the neighboring country and, and that we trust that it's uh, uh, able to handle the situation. And the report also makes it emphatically clear that one major reason for why it was so difficult to reach uh, the uh, Nordic agreements on travel arrangements during the pandemic was the faltering trust that the neighbors had in the Swedish strategy. And with, with rising infection rates and death rates, I think that it's fair uh, of the neighbors to have ex uh, expected a bit more humility and, and a bit less Corona nationalism from the Swedish side. However, <laughs> I'm also of the opinion that we Finns, Norwegians and Danes need to take a long look in the mirror. To be sure, I, I share many of the concerns that people in Norway and Denmark and to a certain extent even Finland have with, with respect to, to the development of Swedish society, crime and, vi and violence in suburbs, neoliberalization of the welfare state, etc. But during the pandemic, we allowed this rhetoric to develop completely out of proportions. It was no longer merely our populist parties who talked about Svenska Tillstand. It became part and parcel of media debate. And I even heard government representatives talk about the Swedish experiment, the Swedish failure, or how we want to avoid, avoid ending up like Sweden. So this tendency of using Sweden bashing in order to win short term political gains was a real low point in Nordic relations during my lifetime. It was shameful and sad. So I think that we need to remember that Sweden is highly politicized in the political discussions across Europe and even globally. And there, that, that there is a lot of suspect information circulating about the dark sides of Swedish societies. And we should really be careful not to contribute to this because sooner or later, uh, 
this faltering kind of Swedish brand will will also hit our beloved beloved Nordic brand because it's immediately connected to that of the Swedish one, like it or not. Finally, to end on a more positive note, I want to emphasize that the report strongly indicated that the practitioners uh, of Nordic cooperation have have uh, experienced uh, practitioners in administration and, and politics and experts these have, have experienced a strengthening of Nordic cooperation during the pandemic. Uh, the Nordic countries have also returned as first others uh, in, in media debate as the first kind of foremost comparative framework. Uh, and, and, and that's good. Politicians and bureaucrats and experts have, have, have all been saying that they've rediscovered te they've discovered teams and Zoom meetings as ways of keeping uh, regular contact with colleagues in neighboring countries and so forth. And this is tremendously important uh, as these everyday networks from a historical perspective have been the defining feature of Nordic cooperation. Uh, the famous trust between the Nordic countries is largely based on these informal networks. So it's a really good starting point if we want to reinvigorate Nordic cooperation for the future, whether it will go in the direction of more institutional forms of cooperation or, or not. So those were my, my, my comments and provocations. Thank you very much for an interesting report. And thank you, Johan, very much for your for your remarks remarks on this report and, and and also for highlighting the indeed i share your concern for the for the sometimes very dark political rhetoric that that has been used during this this pandemic um now let's move to the to the sort of q a uh, session there are some there are one question in the in the chat function but before that taking up that i would actually like to since we have minister bloomquist with us here uh, I would actually like to start with uh, a couple of questions to, to Minister Blomqvist. Um, there, I'm sure you're familiar with the Enestam report that came out uh, on uh, the, the, the kind of Nordic crisis preparedness. And there are some recommendations in that report which kind of touches up on this, on the, on the issues that we've been talking about here today as well. Uh, for instance, there's the recommendation of giving a stronger role, perhaps a stronger mandate to the Nordic cooperation ministers for coordinating Nordic crisis preparedness. Um, I'd like very much to, to hear your take on that. And another question or recommendation brought up in that report is concerns common travel documentation that would make it easier during times of crisis for Nordic citizens to be able to, to travel across borders and so on and forth. So I, I, I'd like to, to hear whether Minister Blomqvist had, what, what, what's your take on these recommendations? Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you to all, all the, for the presentations we have heard. It, it was very, very interesting to, to listen to, to you all. Uh, well, I, I'm, I know the Heinstam report, it was the Council of Ministers uh, uh, who ordered the report and, and uh, it was presented for, for us in Copenhagen in, in last autumn. And, and now we are processing the, the thoughts and, and uh, uh, what Heinstam says could be done or should be done. Uh, I think there are many things uh, that can be uh, put in practice, but uh, I think there are also some things that we have to discuss and maybe some things that we don't agree on uh, all the, the countries in, in, in the Nordic, but but we, we, we ordered the report and I think uh, it, it is very, very valuable for, for us when we are uh, now thinking of, on, on uh, how, how we can do better if we uh, meet and that we will uh, uh, meet another crisis. So it's under, uh, we haven't had uh, a meeting, the uh, Council of Ministers, uh, yet we have it uh, next week or the week after that, 8th of February, we are going to have a, a meeting and then then we are, we are discussing among other things also the NSM report 
Good, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, then I'll I'll take up the the question from the from the chat by Terhi Tikkala. How can we combine the formal and the informal Nordic cooperation in a creative way in order to produce more tangible results, but at the same time remaining relaxed and family-like? So this is a question perhaps um, for mainly to, to the researcher, but I'm sure if Minister Blomqvist wants to address this as well, I'm, 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 he's, he's welcome. But perhaps we'll put this question uh, to Katja and to Christine, Johan, um, Alberto, if you want to comment on this, this particular question here, which is broad and not that easy, of course. Maybe I can start, if you allow me, uh, Chair, to start and, and the rest of you. Um, well, of course, if I knew the answer to this, I would probably work in Copenhagen, uh, but I'm still in Helsinki, so I probably don't have anything uh, exhaustive to say. But I would note that still on a general level, if you look at formal means of cooperation and informal means, I would say that there has been in the recent years a general trend in international relations to focus on informal means of cooperation and soft law arrangement. So um, conclu concluding uh, legally binding conventions, treaties, uh, has not been as popular as before. So I think this uh, Nordic uh, informalization is a general trend also, more broadly speaking. So I don't think it's a problem only for the Nordics. Uh, that would be my take on that. And if Chair allows me to also reply to the question by, was it Max Andersson on, on why Åland was not included. Åland was not included at a, as a cross-border region, but Åland is still a part of Finland and has been a part of the research. And you will also find some sections on that in the report. So, so this to, just to clarify what Alberto already replied. Thanks. All right, let's go, Alberto, and then Christine. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. And well, I'm not a policy maker, so I won't I won't answer as a policy maker. But uh, building on what Katya was already saying, uh, we already have existing soft governance structures. The Nordic Council of Ministers is one of those. We have uh, cross-border uh, committees uh, in in uh, covering all the border areas in the, in the, in the. Um, Nordic countries. We have other uh, forms of soft governance that is not just border um, areas, as Johan uh, very well criticizes. It's not just about the border areas. Uh, so the, the, those structures are, are already there in place. Is perhaps they have been very much overlooked during the pandemic. Uh, nobody asked the questions uh, to the committees about what what restrictions or how to apply the restrictions in those areas. Uh, some claim that uh, not even the ministers of Nordic cooperation, maybe the minister can <laughs> can respond for that, but some interviews uh, refer to that. Not even the minister for Nordic cooperation was asked the question. So my my take would be, well, uh, rely more on these already existing structures. Christine. Yes, it's, it's, as Katja says, it's extremely difficult to have a, a very good answer to this. But at the same time, let me try on the basis of some of the findings that we, we make in the report. Uh, and one is that uh, several of our interviewees actually highlighted that there had, in some instances, been more dialogue uh, politically during the, the pandemic because of the possibilities uh, through digital communication that were sort of bigger than, than before. So I think some of the challenges may be uh, was related to timing uh, and the fact that uh, the timelines, the different, this was happening very fast and the timelines were not synchronized and, and in many respects the Nordic countries were looking to each other so they were sort of reacting a few days later maybe on the basis of what other Nordic countries uh, were doing. Uh, so I think uh, the question of how the formal and informal can be combined uh, would perhaps be precisely referring to for us and to timing and also to uh, sort of putting down the responsibility of who should be in contact uh, because I think also in the Nordic countries that were with dif uh, differences as we've heard in terms of which ministries were managing the, the crisis, who were in charge. In some instances it was health ministries as well as 
as ministries of justice and so on. Uh, so to identify who is the contact point, but also the point at which those um, those discussions should be have and had, and uh, preferably at the earliest possible stage. And I think then you can combine the formal of, of establishing the forum, but at the same time not necessarily predict what the result should be, uh, precisely because there were so so big individual differences in terms of how the pandemic developed in the in the countries. Kimo Sasi has an interesting comment and question in the chat function. When there is a crisis, personal contacts and trust are important. Formal structures can delay things. Rapid initiative is important. So what would be the best way to strengthen the role of ministers of Nordic cooperation? And I would perhaps invite, if we have our minister here still with us, if he wants to first comment on that question, how to strengthen the role of ministers of Nordic cooperation? Well, uh, I've uh, I've heard that question before, and and as a minister of Nordic cooperation, uh, I would of course like like that uh, the the way if, if things are going the way is that that we we had more even more power than we have today, but but of course it's it's every every country's government should should think about the role of of the ministers and and uh, I. Think I know approximately how how the government of, of the other uh, Nordic countries function, but 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 uh, I can only speak for for the Finnish government. And we have had uh, hours, many hours, hundreds of hours of discussions concerning these issues. And of course, I have been part of those discussions. Uh, but there are there has been. Uh, many aspects that we have had to to look into and uh, to to take in, into concern, and uh, now after we have lived with the crisis in for two years, we can say that at least in the beginning we did some mistakes. We could have done better. We have learned, and uh, and now we have taken into uh, consideration uh, in a more proper way. The cross-border regions. Uh, we have taken. Uh, we have had more information exchange of information, and and we have more discussions between officials on on different levels, and and uh, of course the ministers. We have had uh, very good discussions from the start, and and we agreed. I remember it, it very well in our first uh, meeting. We had the, the ministers. Of the Nordic cooperation, had we we agreed on on that two things that we will keep uh, contact with each other, and the second one was that we will respect the decision made in each country. Uh, we maybe didn't understand every decision the other countries did, but we agreed on we, that we would have to have a respect. But of course. To the Kimosasti's questions, question, um, I think that we should uh, consider what the role of the Minister for Nordic Cooperation is in each country and what we, we can do better also together, the, the Ministers for Nordic Cooperation. And uh, that, that is a, an issue that we are thinking about, and, and I hope we will, we will see some some uh, suggestions that will will lead to a better uh, better even better cooperation i'll take one one quick question i i direct this to alberto um so that's the question of that finland put uh, imposed restrictions on swedes uh, coming to finland and, and this perhaps created some sort of sentiment among some swedes of paying finland back uh, so did you have a feeling of such sentiments being being uh, of, of such sentiments or, or or what's your take on that um difficult one i, I think uh, the, i couldn't say that i have heard any specific uh, comment uh, about that but definitely uh, there was a lot of mention to to the very harsh tone in social media for example 
that revived these old rivalries between Swedish Finnish uh, uh, relations in the past. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this kind of issue also emerged in this harsh tone in social media. Uh, unfortunately, in some to some extent, in local media has, uh, has also uh, emerged this debate and uh, pointing fingers uh, and so so this nationalistic agenda at uh, at, at a very local level. Uh, we met, we heard even from uh, f from cases where uh, this um, violence trans uh, tr uh, transcended uh, the virtual world also to vandalize cars, for example, that had the plate from Sweden or or Finland otherwise. Um, so. These social tensions emerge in the interviews, but not this specific uh, case, I have to say. Well, let's hope that's very temporal in any case and very and sort of isolated, isolated uh, instances of, of, of such things. Um, I would like at this point to thank everybody for participating in this webinar very much. Thanks a lot to, to, the, to the speakers um, and, and thanks for the great job with, a, with an excellent, excellent report. And, and thanks, uh, Minister Blomqvist, for taking taking time out to to also uh, participate in in this webinar, which we fi found very valuable. So, um, for my on my behalf, thank you very much, and see you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.